So that's a sign of a cheap act. They blame the audience. <laughs> Somebody write that down. There was once a world in which the paramount creatures had their choice of what to think about. They could think either they could either think about Brussels sprouts or steam shovels, and that was all. Except, of course, for the would-be enlightened who seemed to pop up everywhere. Ordinary minds are not capable of objectively describing themselves, nor easily able to hear extraordinary ones do so. As part of the ongoing testing procedure, the head of one monastery one day asked the young monks this question. Which troubles you the most, the fact that half the world is hungry or that you have a sore in your mouth? The ordinary see their greatest personal challenge in how to have better relationships with other people, while the would-be mystic's major concern is in regard to his relationship with his own unusual interests. If your level of consciousness amounts to mo no more than your thought, to the thoughts that normally go through your mind, then you're still at man's minimal state of awareness and understanding. Life was not broken till man appeared to say that it was. One man had two nervous systems, one of which was with him during times when he would withdraw from everyday affairs and live alone in reflective seclusion, and the other nervous system was the one that accompanied him when he had returned to town. A viewer writes, it seems like everything you talk about you say has two aspects to it. Is there some point to this? <laughs> the condition you're in, if the body is alive, and the mind is conscious, then taken as a whole, what is man's state of existence? As long as you believe that everything and anything mysterious and extraordinary, if it exists, does so outside of you, you'll never experience what it is. And from an ordinary view, I admit this sounds unfair, since if you're wired up in the manner described, there's no changing it. But on the other hand, if you do have that certain potential, then look upon this as encouraging, a promise of discovery to come. One man's recent sentiments on a certain subject, he put thusly, it's like my mind gave the rest of me an original guided tour of life, which was neat enough, but damn, it keeps forcing a replay of it on me over and over again. <laughs> Minds and the widespread problem of pain. There are only two kinds of things that can hurt you those that can hurt you, and those you think about. <laughs> there was once a man who knew the secret, and as an aid to others who were interested, he stopped talking. And later, as even greater assistance, he pretended to be dead. <laughs> To be fully realized, each mystic must relive the life of every mystic who've got, who's gone before him. As the first man was expelled from the direct presence of his creator, as he left the garden, he heard a really loud noise. There are no mystical legends or myths that say the secret whispers. Those flawed feel life is. When he became aware of a certain internal situation, which he found unacceptable, one man's effort at change progressed along this line. At first, he attempted to stop the automatic flow of thoughts through his mind, then later determined he'd settle for becoming indifferent to them. And one man developed this approach to health. If he wasn't feeling good, he'd look at himself to see if he was bleeding or had any broken bones, and if, it, if not, he'd say to his bad feelings, get lost. <clears throat> Anything the mind can think is immediately open to dual interpretations. And with a bit of extraordinary effort, three. Then pushing it even more, even more. And yet, two is all that's necessary to think and get by. 
As he speaks, an ordinary man's gestures are as unwitting, unconscious, unplanned, and involuntary as the words they apparently reflect. A viewer writes, you recently invited us to ponder the significance of the fact that only two types of people never give advice, the enlightened and the dead. And after thinking on this, I've come up with my own poser. Do the dead not give advice because they can't? Or because when dead, men then become enlightened enough to realize its futility? Uh, and now a wrap-up of stories concerning minds and the unbridled freedom of thinking. To broaden his vo voter appeal, one candidate for mayor has promised that if elected, he will restrict winter to nighttime hours only. <laughs> and in science news, an anthropologist has announced his discovery in the high Himalayas of the frozen and perfectly preserved body of the world's oldest human, who he estimates has been dead since at least 1948. <laughs> and over to technology, this item. An inventor has developed a home thermostat that if turned completely off, is smart enough to tell when the temperature gets so cold that it actually should not be off and will automatically turn itself back on. <laughs> and minds everywhere. <laughs> and minds everywhere are surprised, amazed, and astounded at such stories and cry out, Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Which sentiment itself is something to think about. <laughs> How the transcendental can be manifest at the mundane level. In certain extreme examples of, examples of alpha male wolves, no matter their actual sex, they can frighten the weaker ones in such a way that they can easily translate the experience into mystical terms. <laughs> the difference in the understanding of the awakened and the ordinary. When the awakened are punched in the nose, they think, I've been punched in the nose, and that's it. <laughs> the obvious can't win you over, persuade, or convert you. How to tell whether things mystical are real or not? The body never hallucinates. If ordinary thinking turns merely annoying molehills into truly terrifying mountains, then the transcendental variety should change them into gold mines. How to tell that you're becoming more aware and less ordinary? You think about it less. Everyone has the sound of a stream running through their yard, and most people aren't satisfied until they amp it. The high cost of not looking after your intellectual health. If you're never more conscious than your ordinary state, then you have nothing to lose. Why it is so difficult to locate real mystical data. The only maps possessed by the awakened perfectly match that which they represent and thus seem to be no maps at all. A certain father invited his son to draw the absolute best, absolutely best sketch possible of a distant mountain. And the lad traveled thereto, returning with a rock therefrom, striking his father's head therewith. <laughs> and to describe the elder's response as delighted would be an under description. On some planets where thinking creatures have evolved, their nervous systems are constructed in such a fashion that their thinking operations sit right on top of their feeling ones, which sometimes results in their feelings becoming so upset that they silently force thinking to invent a new name for them so that they won't look so bad in front of their friends. <laughs>
a cosmic tip. Never play bingo on a world where one of the letters on the card is I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that there's an I in the word bingo, but I'm talking about another I. The young will play with themselves where it feels good, while the older keep rubbing its sores. One of life's presently unrecognized purposes of man's mind is to have his thinking ultimately cut up reality as he perceives it into smaller and smaller pieces until they're the same as reality. Those of expanded consciousness are like readers who cheat and jump ahead in the book to the end. The Charity of Air one man was of such help to his neighbors that they didn't even realize it. And he eventually expanded his assistance to the point that they ceased to exist, as if they ever did. Water feels no compassion for fish, and none but the foolish would expect so, yet men claim to believe that life <coughs> mistreats them. How to tell if you're beginning to see things as they are? The body never whines. Once you understand the nature and purpose of man's mental world, you realize that no one's ideas are worthy any opposition. Only idiots shout at one another and, sh and throw shit balls. And how do you tell if you're one? Do you yell and mentally throw things? Having said all that, and less some, Let's not forget that in the routine world, opposition to ideas is necessary for ideas to grow and flourish, but which does not come into play in the transcendental realm. Simple put time. What kind of reasonable denial can you offer to the obvious? And who but a fool will try? The only thing possible for a man to say that would be a reflection of his own understanding would be the expression of an observation that he himself had never seen or heard before. <coughs> Those who worry about the possible damage man might do to life are certainly loyal little troopers for life. <laughs> the limitations of mere outlook. To the more conscious mind, optimism is but a first step not an achievement. Men who laugh at and feel superior to animals are superior to no one. So mused one man. If it is true that all talk is foolishness in that it is not the content of what is said that is its reasons for being, but rather it is merely the act of speaking itself that is the prime purpose, then if this indeed be true, it will save me from a multitude of meaningless minor annoyances. <clears throat> well, at least it should save me. On one world, the more alert have posted a reward for the recovery and safe return of memory, <laughs> where appropriate. Alternative awareness in the payroll records of one's routine mental employment. Extended states of consciousness can seem to the ordinary mind as a kind of working off the clock. A real thinker with notes who does not ultimately abandon his notes will eventually lose his ability to really think. Only the untreatably troubled believe that life can cure them of their ills. To that extraordinary end, one man developed his own personal mystical method of secret chasing, which consisted of him never ever, more than absolutely necessary just to stay alive and get by, never ever looking at anything taking place on this planet, but rather always outward, away from where man stands. How to give the mind the blues. Think about things it's not used to. A father so instructed a son, 
advanced course, forget the regular laws of physics, in the city, scum rises to the top. Is it not understandable why all civilized people require that the state educate the children and not receive same at home, and they not receive same at home? The more conscious mind is its own home, father, and source of knowledge. As the mythical express drew ever nearer Istanbul, the conductor, as he walked the aisles, had less and less to say. <laughs> Recent headlines in alleged paper. Hormone discovered in brain that distorts way we think. <laughs> like they always say, the only thing certain in life are death and more death. All ships on the common seas have captains, yet without one, they sail on. There are certain things that cannot be told to the mind directly, such as anything objectively having to do with itself. One guy decided that he had tried to stop thinking about negative things, then about time, then about other people's affairs, then about his own, and you'll never guess what he plans to try next. The possibilities of consciousness, a new aerial view. Without the potential to fly, you can't crash. And without the realization that crashed is the mind's normal condition, you'll never experience true flight. Once upon a time, a man left his home planet and journeyed to another world where he stuck his finger in an exotic wall socket. <laughs> <laughs> One man dismisses the words, melody, or particular style of song saying that the only thing that matters to him in music is that it make him feel good, that it be party music. Not unlike the attitude of the more conscious toward knowledge. The only kind of interest to them is that which makes them feel good and want to mentally party. Well, let's see. <coughs> we haven't discussed fingernails in a long time. I don't know, I just, I'm not sure there's anything else to talk about. It can always prove to be apropos to note this again, since whoever wrote these things noted it tonight and what was read already. If your level of consciousness, or if your consciousness amounts to no more than the thoughts that naturally go through your mind, then you're still at man's minimal state of awareness and understanding. You can end up, an ordinary mind could end up listening to such as this and not surprisingly come to a conclusion that uh, words are being played with having to do with consciousness, awareness, and thought. And there is a kind of inherent possible danger of someone listening to such as this long enough and in whatever way they thought I was talking about it becomes the way in which they accept it to be. Which you could do worse, but you could do a hell of a lot better. <laughs> which is coming up with your own understanding of it. But it's b back at the heart, it's not the absolute beginning of any and all discussions throughout the ages, even pretending that things have changed from for instance, China 5,000 years ago, or India 3,000 years ago, or Greece 2,000 years ago, 
for a town that, well, it all, the level of consciousness, uh, the effect of man's collective civilization, that all of this shifts in such a way that we must continually update such as this, give new descriptions, which, again, is not a disingenuous description, but it's sure not the best one. But all the descriptions, the whole thing of man's civilization, and specifically any talk of an individual escaping the confines of what he should be internally, and to find some other area, like another state of consciousness, another state, another condition in which he can put his nervous system. The beginning of all that is to even think about it, and then for it to have any reasonably successful basis of a discussion, each person has got to have some idea, even if you have just adopted it from me, which is not very good, but you've got to have some idea of what's going on internally and not simply to know thyself and go waste your time or waste a lifetime and wondering then later do I study the right self. The whole thing about know thyself as I keep suggesting is not anything specific and all who repeat that all the way from the religious to the philosophically inclined in, at the ordinary level, they believe there's a point to it that there can be something said if you say, well, know thyself, that there is something can be said after that. Anyone who agrees that it should be of importance to know thyself, if they say that, and you give them an impartial face, and you go, hmm. If they say anything after that, they've got no idea what they're talking about. But that is the ordinary mind, that after the whole, not just the repetition of the phrase or the dictum or the hectoring of know thyself, not just the phrase itself, but they believe that there is an outcome to it, that there is something to be said, that if indeed a follower of such a directive put forth enough effort that someday, if he was lucky and circumstances right, he or she would benefit therefrom, and if they did, there would certainly be something to be said about it. Wrong. The know thyself is to understand that there is an internal life of man that is so direct, so lacking in complexities and subtleties, <laughs> that the knowing of thyself amounts to almost zero. <laughs> it amounts to simply a realization. <laughs> but to talk about that, you have got to get past all the historic, and even the ones you may still carry with you, but all the historic ideas of man having a heart, a soul, a spirit, a divine spark, that's not either right or wrong, but that leads nowhere. It's for you to simply see, to start off at the most basic level, if a man sits down and thinks, I will study myself, what people normally ignore is there's the place to start studying, because after that they normally say, well, what should I study? Should I study my behavior? Should I study my religious beliefs? Should I study the relationship I have with my family, with my children, my loved ones? Should I study the relationship between me and my government, my king? Should I be studying uh, how I look at other people's behavior? They indeed can spend another portion of their life concerned with, well, I want to know myself, but uh, I should be studying myself, but in what manner or what aspect of life? As soon as you say, as soon as a man is reflective enough to say, well, I should know something about me, uh, there's no, if you have any ability to see, then there is no question after that, there is no doubt, but there's no problem is looking around like, well, where will I start, you know, and what way should I go about it? The obvious question, that is, almost entirely overlooked by people, is to simply consider what is it in me as opposed to anything else I can observe and anything else I have any direct or even sort of intuitive knowledge, if that means anything, which is problematic to ordinary minds, but to say, well, I'm going to study myself. What's the first question? Is why do I, who's this saying that I'm going to study myself? What is it in me from where, from whence cometh even the notion 
And if that doesn't, if that sounds too mundane to be someone saying, well, they hear the idea of enlightenment or awakening consciousness to some other level, or the regeneration of oneself through some religious activity, anything of an extraordinary nature, that a person sits there and goes, that's it. If I'm speaking too broadly, back to a specific, the first time you've read, say that you're wired up with a kind of interest in such as this, and then you finally stumble across some book, some Sufi book, some Zen book, The Life of Buddha, something, and you read it, the description of enlightenment, you read, I don't know, maybe what Buddha said, but people after that, and you go, that's it, that is it, that is what's been troubling me, that's what I want. And let us say that then you pick up the idea of whatever book or whatever source you're taking this from, uh, says that the methods that they have used is a kind of introspection of some kind. And that you pick out, I'm just trying to make this broader or more specific than just the broad know thyself because that, maybe that sounded too inspecific and too theoretical. But someone undertakes a, a specific form of a so-called mystical method, such as meditation, attempting to remember one's self with every breath, to remember, one, to remember the name of God, to do any of that, the first thing that should strike one when they hear the method and you go, yes, that's it. Or when you hear the aim, enlightenment, of being, having a mind of no mind, whatever it is you study across, the blessed reunion with God. Wherever you find it and you read it and it strikes you that without any doubt, that is it. That guy, wherever he was, whoever he was, is describing, that's it. That's what I feel in here. All right, now I got something. At least I've got some idea where to start. I'm going to try and reflect upon my mind until it becomes a still reflective pool. I'm going to try and remember the names, the many names of God until my very essence of consciousness merges. Whatever it was you read, and you go, yes, that's it, that's it. Let's see, now how will I start? There's one start for all of it and always has been. It doesn't mean everyone starts there by any means. I don't, I'm not trying to infer that you missed it somewhere along the line because you can go half a lifetime before you ever get really started. But hey, you'd have been doing something. The place to start, and someone goes, that's it, but now how do I get started? The information seems to be lacking, or I can't seem to get the real feel of it just from this book, or the man lived so long ago, has it changed? You always have this. Your mind, that's part of the nature of the ordinary mind, is that it always seems uncertain. There's always open to further enlightenment or further education, that it never looks at things and sees an obvious answer. It, it does not reach satisfying conclusions. That is not the nature of ordinary thought. So there you are, and you have decided, this is it. That's it. I'm going to start. And you think, well, shit, where do I start? I was all excited there when I read it, and I had to get up and walk outside and throw rocks and smoke 14 packs of cigarettes and drink more coffee, and I had to slap myself. I am so delighted. Now I'm on the... I'm, I know, finally, I've set my foot on the path. <sighs> okay, how do I start? And you can kill another good, sort, sizable portion of your life even after that of going, well, where do I start? Where is the obvious place? And we're way beyond theory. This is it. Where is the obvious place? As you should ask yourself, what is it in me? What is it in man? What is it about me? Pick out some description here that you like or make up your own is that there you sit, and you have no, no doubt whatsoever that this is what you should be trying to do, to know thyself, to awaken consciousness to some other level, to have a continual consciousness of you as an impart or as an objective entity in this ever-changing kaleidoscope and scenario that we call life. I don't know where you would have read that, but... <laughs> if you ever do run across a book like that, lay it down and... Go outside and walk around. <laughs> or report them to me, by God. Sue them for plagiarism. <sighs> the obvious place is where is this coming from? What is it about me? I can keep putting it, but you understand what I'm going to get at. It's here. People can talk about that the spirit of the gods have moved them, that uh, there is some cosmic itch that brings about an interest in such as this. You can call it anything you want to. But you're faced with an absolute, if you've got any ability to see, if you have any potential to see objectively, you're faced with a cold, hard, clinical fact 
and there's no way around it, that were it not for you being, were it not for the activity of the human mind, of your mind, you would not be sitting there or standing deciding that you want to become a mystic, that you want to become more conscious, that this is what you want to do and that you have decided that you hear the persuasive validity of the message that you should be a continual observer of yourself. You should be studying oneself, that the life lived with no examination was a life spent futilely. That's what the oracle at Delphi was trying to say. No, it was Socrates trying to say it. But anyway, I'm glad I could have been of help on your behalf. <laughs> I sent that message to Socrates with a card signed by and with your name. There is only one place, and that's the human mind. Uh, that sounds, I know, uh, after all this time, it sounds pretty simple and direct, and sometimes people, uh, uh, uh. the ramifications of that uh, do not lend themselves to someone going, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's not, yeah, 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 based upon any understanding, because if you understood it, you wouldn't even be reacting and go, yeah, 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 yeah. It is that that is the source of all mystical desire. It's the source of everything unique in man. But there is a point past which that if you just try and work directly on consciousness, assume that you in some have on your own been able to unpeel in your own personal way. What really distinguishes operationally the mind from consciousness from thought is why I start out tonight saying this is the ordinary minds could hear this as being just playing with words. But there is a specific difference, and I've been writing for the last year or so news items about the sounds of the heart beating and stomachs talking to brains, the kind of conversation that they would have in my imaginary dialogues. Because there, at first blush, is nothing comparable to reality on this planet, to human thought. And once you do see that everything singular about man first off arises from human thought, and anything else is imagination, anything else is a too elementary telling of it, such as the belief that we're singular because God picked us out. That may be, but that doesn't tell you anything. You don't have to say, well, that's not true. You don't have to get in an argument and say, well, that's just, those kind of religious tales are just foolishness. It may be, it may not be, but even if it's true, it doesn't tell you anything, which is what I was trying to indicate to you that night about people talking religiously and that you can see it from a certain objective view, not a hostile view, but an objective view based upon giving their own ammunition or the person thanking God that they were saved from the tornado that wiped out their house. And they thank God for saving them from this calamity. And you can say, well, that's foolish. And, you, or, and then you can say, well, God doesn't exist. That's got nothing to do with it. Or when I was trying to expand to say you can hear in a certain way, for instance, in the religious example, people talking about God wanted me to do this or the God said this. And you can see that they have no idea what they're talking about. That does not mean, it doesn't even matter. It's not an argument saying, well, God doesn't exist. God may exist. Let me give you that. Maybe God exists. The point is, look at them and listen, and they got no idea whether he does or not. That is the nature of human talk and not just in religion. Now we're back to something a bit more specific. You have decided that you have adopted some idea, which is based upon human talk, that what you're going to do is undertake a method to study thyself that you're going to undertake to have an objective, continual awareness of yourself amidst all the hurly-burly of everyday affairs. You first then should ask, wait a minute. After you decide, well, how am I going to get started? Where you get started is, well, wait a minute. Why does this seem to make any sense? What is the one function within me, the one operation, the one reality in me right this second that were it not there, were it not so, I would not be involved with this sort of thinking? And of course, it's thinking. If I could not think, I would not be thinking about such as this. And you try and tell your mind that, and your mind, oh, come on. <laughs> Don't start that crap on me again. And usually, that's enough to get you 
correctly off the track. At any rate, it is possible, once you see that, it would be predictable that a person, let me clarify that, when I say it's predictable, it does not mean by any account that people who ever, ever get to the point of even wanting to be mystics ever get to the point of narrowing down to the degree that I just mentioned, that is the human mind, the source of the desire. And I'm still not saying that that is the ultimate source any more than I'm saying whether God exists or not. That's not the point. It's the people who say, well, God wants me to do so and so. Or people that look right at you and go, I'm going to tell you what, if I know one thing, I know that God exists. They don't know that any more than they know anything, which is nothing. It's not from their own understanding. So I'm saying that most people never even get to the point of realize that the mind is the source of everything unique in man. I'm not saying that that is the ultimate source, but they don't get to the point of realizing that this is the source behind whatever I think it is right presently, such as, well, God made, made man unique. May have, but that doesn't tell you anything. There's something more observable, there's something more direct and closer to you that is observable and knowable than ideas that some external force made man singular. You can see that his mind makes him singular, that there's no way around it. What, and then what I was saying, if you do ever see that, it would be predictable after that. If you're one of the few that even got that far, it would be predictable after that. Not unexpected that you could spend the rest of your life somewhere, well, the rest of your life between here and the actual experience of the secret, but that you could spend a lifetime, if necessary, still involved with the apparent working on one's thinking, which at the even the known public or the publicly known level of this kind of mystical activity, and I'll just use the kind of descriptions that are publicly known, such as uh, attempting to calm the mind into the point, to calm the disturbances of the mind through meditation, through exercise, through fasting, a change of diet, prayer, to change, to uh, still the mind to such a degree that it is no longer just churning up and reflecting whatever happens to be bouncing around out. I'm using their descriptions now. To whatever that your mind is like a the water on water in a pool and it is reflecting since it is active too it is in conjunction or in harmony with it reacts to what's going on out here and therefore the mind stays like nah, 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 because life goes nah, 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 nah. but if you studied the mind if you worked on the mind enough if you're going to reach buddhahood satori enlightenment is that the mind itself suddenly becomes calm and is a perfect reflector of what's going on and is not affected by it. And you think, and you'd be well within your rights. It is a beautiful description as far as descriptions go. It's not the best because the best one, no one knows. The best one is whatever you discover, but it's a good one. And so it would not be, if someone gets to the point that, that they recognize that, that that is closer than anything, that's closer than any. Any so-called method dealing with faith, dealing with doing good works, dealing with uh, paying homage to some living or dead guru or some imagined supernatural figure, or pursuing rules and regulations from some organized cult or some large spread organization, that there is a close to the script. It just suddenly strikes you that that's it. Then after that, if you reach that point, it would be predictable. It would not be unexpected that you could spend the rest of your life doing that. And history and monasteries right now of all stripes are filled with quite well-meaning, sincere people who may sit there for another 30 or 40 years attempting to reach that kind of state through the best way they know how, the best way they've been told, such as, well, sit there and don't move. That's the standard one. First off, stop the body, sit there, take up the, take up the sitting position, sit there, for the next eight hours of the rest of us. And hey, it's worked before. That's all we know to do. It could work with you. You got a better idea. We didn't invite you here. Either do it and shut up. Well, that's what you're left with. You could do worse. You could do better, but you could do worse. So there you are. And history, as I said, history is full of people who, according to history, succeeded. And of course, history is, unrecorded history is even more crown full of those that just did it. You, you don't know. It's not just history, as I said. Right now, there are quite well-meaning, sincere people involved with some form such as that. 
And it sounds, as I'm saying, it sounds It has the ring of the truth to certain people. And if it does, then until you know better, there's nothing wrong with the description. And there would be nothing wrong if you had no other alternative and the conditions are right to pursuing that kind of method. But here's what I'm getting at. Having said all that, even if it struck you, even if for a while you attempted it, either at home or you went and tried to join up some monastery to sit there for a given number of hours a day, a sizable portion of the day to sit there, and to, all they tell you is, the point is we're trying to still the body, I mean to ultimately still the mind, and that is the absolute prerequisite for any form of enlightenment. The dear Buddha said it and everyone after him or whatever line they were apparently tracing their lineage from, and they say, and so you know, there's no direct way to do it, and what we do is this. We sit. We get together and we sit. We sit motionless for 10 hours a day because we obviously must do that. We must still the body before we can ever talk about stilling the mind. And you go, okay, it sounds right. And you're already sold on the idea that this is where all human possibility lies. So you could even actively undertake such a passive activity. <clears throat> so there you sit, literally and figuratively, for a while. And remember, I'm giving, making this, or let's operate on this basis, that it is not an invalid description. It is not a totally disingenuous method. But there you sit for a while, doing everything they said. You're not overeating. You've given away all your possessions. You cut off all ties outside, and you sit there 10 hours a day like everybody else. What are you attempting to do? Put it to you another way. What might you do that would be faster than that? Put it to you another way. What might you do? That, make all, that makes all such activity moot. That was pretty harsh. I'll soften it. What could you do that would be a proper prerequisite to even that? Then parenthetically on my verbal page, I had a prerequisite to such a point that if accomplished, renders the apparent subsequent activity then moot. End of parentheses. Anybody follow that? <laughs> Rather than me saying that it renders, that it makes the activity moot, it's that there is a certain thing that you can see Or as I've already put it to you, there's a question that you should have asked yourself, that you could have asked yourself, either before you started the activity of sitting or somewhere shortly thereafter, a year, half a lifetime, sometime, that the answer to the question would render then the activity moot. What's the question that no one asks that undertakes such activity? The question is, what is it in me that hears this as being an acceptable form or an acceptable way to devote my life to? That you traveled to the monastery, you found the man, and he went, yes, we're, you hold up a, some book you read or the supposed history of a certain obscure line of Buddhism, whatever it was, and they go, yes, 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 if you found it, that is, we're still doing that. Can I join? Yes, well, all right. You went to all this trouble, come on in, give it a try. And he, you say, well, exactly what is you do? And he says, well, all we do is you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and only for a few timeouts we go in this big room and we all sit for 10 hours. You do not move. You do not talk. In fact, from henceforth, you never talk again unless the head of the school calls you in, which he may periodically do or he may not, and, ask, and he may talk to you. And if he doesn't, you don't talk. And I said, you're welcome to try it if you want to. And it still strikes you, okay, I'll try it. Somewhere along the line, what, as I'm putting it to you really roughly, the question that should have struck you then, which I'm speaking figuratively, but the question is, when you hear, yes, all right, I'll do it. That, sound, that sounds, yeah, okay. So you walk out and it's your first night. What is the question no one ever asked? 
what is it in me that heard this as being a proper way to approach whatever it is I seem to be looking for? No one ever asked that. What is it? Not imaginary, not something about, well, it's a, some sort of divine curiosity that the gods, that fate, that something has put in me. That may or may not be true. But what can you look at right there? You alone. You don't need any books. You don't need your imagination about whether gods or external systemic forces exist. You're sitting right there with one thing, you. You're sitting there in the room. You decide, I'm going to do this, or else you've been doing it for a number of years. But the description of it, of here's what we do, here's what the approach we're going to take, here's what we're after, here's how it's been done, here's exactly how we do it. We can't guarantee results, but here's how we do it. What do you think? Do you want to try it? And you go, yes, I do. What is it in you that heard that as being the kind of thing to do? Where is it you can look that requires no imagination, no guesswork, no speculations? What is it in you that heard that? What is it in you that went, yes, may I join up and come and sit with you 10 hours a day and not talk and only eat a little bit of food and not own anything? What is it in you that heard that and found it agreeable? Your stomach? <laughs> your liver? Your thigh muscles? Your biceps? Your lower back? <laughs> what? Your breathing? Your heart rate? Your blood pressure? Your kidney output? Your sexual hormones? What? Well, I can wait it out as long as you can. <laughs> <laughs> what is it in a man that will hear that kind of call, that kind of description as to a proper way to devote his time in the description having to do with a study of oneself. Because that's what it amounts to. And the inference always being that you must be prepared to undertake this for perhaps a lifetime and never achieve it. I'll do it. And they jump immediately from undertaking to accepting the idea that you, that a man must study himself, that you cannot achieve any other condition. You cannot become a rejuvenated person. You cannot uh, become a more conscious, a more enlightened, a more awakened person until you know what the hell you are. You can't become something new and improved until you know what you are now. And the mind goes, that's, that's true. Okay, that's true. Then they immediately jump. It's like trying to, when you hear that we're all going to start on, in, from Paris on the great mystical Mythical Orient Express, and we're going to Istanbul. You go, that's it, great. They go, and the only way to get there is a kind of extraordinary, transcendental knowledge of oneself. You go, yes, I love it, I love it. And by so doing, no one to keep up my allegory, as soon as people do that, and they go, well, sit down and let's start meditating. You go, by God, I will. The mind believes that you have, by that one act, by that one acceptance, you have... The mind believes that it has gone immediately from Paris to at least the extreme eastern portion of Bulgaria, or Greece, I guess it would be. Now, in other words, it believes that you are right upon the Bosporus. You're, you're just close to the bridge. Istanbul is only you know, a heartbeat, a few weeks, a few months away. This immediate jump covers up the question that's never asked. That I'm saying that if it was per perceived in the correct way, can turn then the effort as you accepted it to be, turn it into a moot act. That you hear the description. Yes, that's it. That's it. I knew it was something about, I knew that I felt as though I were some sort of stranger to myself or however you thought. Anybody wired up at all for this will accept the description, which is always given, 
that you cannot just start from where you are. You've got to sort of clean up your machine. You've got to clean up the act you're in. You have got to, in some way, be a better, more knowledgeable person than you are right now. No offense to you, they'll say. Or they probably won't. It's only me that <laughs> throws in that kind of shit. They'll probably say, shame on you. You just got here in time. Boy, another few months, you hadn't come to see us. You'd have had no chance. But... <laughs> The point is, they say, you cannot really start from where you are. You've got to know what you're working with. And you go, yes. And it all amounts to you've got to know something about you. You can't come staggering in here to our secret <laughs> mystical school and come, you know, coming in and you're whistling and knocking things over and you slam the door. Who the hell do you think you are? And you're looking around, I'm talking to you, and you're going, oh, what? Huh? Huh? Straighten up, my good man. I mean, how do you expect that you're going to become some... <laughs> That you're going to reach Buddhahood and enlightenment, and there you stand, and you know, you're tripping on the carpet, you're knocking over things on my desk. You, you've got no idea. You're not even aware of yourself. God, is this man insightful or what? People, calm down. Under the right conditions, that can almost seem as though it were a mystical experience. But the guy goes, calm down. You, I feel more conscious already. It's just the first time since you were four or five years old that somebody more or less you know, hit you on the head and said, stop it. You know. But no one, ever, no one ever questions, what is it in me that accepts, that hears as being valid the description that you must study yourself, that you've got to have some knowledge of what you are. You've got to, you just got to know something about you. You can't just jump from what you are now. You're just kind of a whole bundle of all kinds of involuntary gestures, and you're just stumbling around, and half the time you don't know what you're doing. You look at the way you behave in life. I, I'll bet you, says the guy running the school, or the guy at the front desk, he says, I'll just bet you the large part of the activities that, in which you've been involved throughout your life have actually been self-defeating. You go, the man's a mind reader. <laughs> I'll bet you feel probably regretful, shameful, guilty over, you know, a large part of the stuff you've done up until now. And you feel that the man is looking right into my very soul. <laughs> so they, at any rate, you will immediately accept, if you're wired up to that point, the idea that you have got to study yourself, that you have got to have some non-routine knowledge of what you are. And you go, yes, I hear it. And to do so, we have got to undertake some sort of extreme, specific regimen. All right. And I'm not saying not all right, except there's a question that no one ever perceives, generally. Is that, let's say if they accepted you, they go, well, go get a good night's sleep and be up at 6.30 ready to sit. And you go, yes, I will. You should go back to the little room they assigned you and think, what is it? Now that I'm here and I agree to it, what is it in me that agreed to it? What is it in me that hurt it? And then you go through it if you had to. Was it my liver? No. Was it my feet? No. Was it my hands? No. Was it my neck? No. Kidneys, liver. Then, once you see that quite clearly, then there is a second or a sub-question to that one. If it's my mind that hears this as being the author authoritative, the correct directive as to what it should be doing, if it's my mind that heard that and agreed to it, just, I don't mean just agreed theoretically, but it, my mind went, yes. <coughs> if it's, as though I could feel the righteousness of its reaction. Okay. It was my mind. Nothing else. Nowhere else to look. My mind did that. Okay. The sub-question is, even without this study of myself yet, I have some vague sort of peripheral awareness of the dependability and the reliability of my mind up till now. <laughs> where, where the hell getteth off I trusting my mind to go, yes, that's it that it's going to study, it doesn't know it yet, but it's trying, it's going to study itself. And there is nothing in your past other than learning the multiplication tables and <laughs> being able to work crossword puzzles maybe, play a little chess. Other than that, there is no 
basis whatsoever in your life experience. No basis whatsoever upon which you should rely on your mind. And it went, yes. But ordinary people, they think, well, it's my soul went yes. My spirit went yes. My hunger for God cried out, yes. Your mind said, yes. On what basis? On anybody. And the, the more conscious you are, I'm not talking about ordinary people, but the more conscious are you are, the less likelihood or the less basis you've got to rely on anything you've ever thought. I mean, to even be where you are now, sitting there in that monastery, you'd have to look at it as an accident. You've got to have no potential to be able to sit there right that time and think, well, now I'm here. Maybe I'm now on the track starting in the morning. And you start asking the questions I'm doing, like, wait a minute. What is it that made me agree when the monk told me what we were going to do? And I went, yes. And you go, that's my mind. That's all. And then the sub-question about, well, wait a minute. My mind's agreed that we'll come in here, give up my whole life, to study what amounts to it is itself, yeah? On what basis do I have, on what basis should I trust at all anything my mind says to me? What basis do I have in my experience, other than the few examples I enumerated? And if you have any ability, all of this is beginning to stretch the limits of speech, of course. If you have any ability then to see, you know that the answer is, I got no basis. What I'm saying could render certain subsequent efforts after that moot is to jump past that point that I'm implying you can spend a long time just working on the mind, thinking it's all having to do with the mind. But here's the question. What made the mind get interested in this? Not only should I trust the mind, now we're past that. If it's all back to the mind, if that's where it all springs from, then the mind springs from somewhere. My interest in this springs from somewhere. From where? Is it mental? Is it an intellectual interest? If it is, we don't have time for me to try to logically prove anything, which is good since I couldn't. If it is all, as it appears, there all arises the interest from the mind and all the efforts seem to be ultimately directed toward a study of oneself, which is a study of the mind, because you soon have got to understand, well, studying my hands is not going to make me more conscious. <laughs> studying the way I move offers a little more promise, but Jesus, how long does that take <laughs> to realize I'm a clumsy oaf? So it gets down to a study of the mind. And then you get past the point of thinking, well, how, why should I be depending on my mind? What's the basis of that? Then you eventually got to get to the point of thinking, well, am I actually trying to study my mind? Is that the point? That's all. Did I get all on one? <laughs>